Good morning. Welcome to worship. Uh, my name is Aaron. This is Alex. Let's sing. Let's stand. Let's have a good time together. I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings a chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The king of glory. Why don't you greet one another and have a seat? Hi, Discovery. A big piece of how we celebrate Christmas here is Illuminate Advent. Every year we ask all of our local and global partners what they can use for their ministries this upcoming year and we bring those requests to our congregation. This is our way as a whole church to generously bless and serve our local and global partners at Christmas. This year you'll find all the requests on tags displayed in the lobby. Each tag has two parts. 
The front tag has all the information about the request and when it is due back. You can take this part home with you. The back part has a place for you to fill out your name and contact information. Please take a moment to fill this tag out and place it in the boxes near the display. If you're joining virtually or you prefer to give online, you can check out dc2.me slash advent with ways to give to each of our partners. This is a great opportunity to learn more about our local and global partners. In the following videos, you'll meet volunteers from Discovery who serve with our local partners or who have visited one of our global partners. Each week, there will also be an Advent guide and an email highlighting our partners so you can learn what's happening in their ministries and how we can pray for them. If you have any questions, there's folks in the lobby by the tags each week to help guide you. Or you can email me at katie at dc2.me and I would be happy to help you. We're so glad you're here and Merry Christmas! Hello, Discovery Church. My name is Mike Krieger, and I'm the site coordinator for WizKids Broomfield. And uh, WizKids is a tutoring program that doesn't cost the students anything. It's for lower, underprivileged kids that are behind in math, specifically math and the reading. You know, it's, it's about the relationship. Um, and uh, it's just, you know, pretty special time. It takes a while to get to know the kids and for having them to trust you. But uh, once they do that, um, it's, it's really, it's golden. This year we're looking for uh, two books for each of our kids. We have about 15 kids, so that'd be 30 books. Because um, again, as I said, they, they don't have their own little personal library. So that would be, that would be very special. Um, you can visit the Advent display in the lobby to find ways to give to WizKids this Advent season. Thank you and have the merriest of Christmases. Hi. My name is Harper Williamson. I am excited to represent our partners, Pastor Jesus and Pastor Nelson with Praying Pelican Missions in Costa Rica. I visited Costa Rica last September and I feel like it has changed me by learning about our brothers and sisters in Christ in another country, true gratitude and powerful worship. To learn about the ministry in Costa Rica, check out the Advent Guide on this website or in our weekly email. You can also visit the Advent display in the lobby to find ways you can give to our partners in Costa Rica this Advent. Merry Christmas! Hi, my name is David Christoph. I serve with Discovery's Benevolence Ministry. I was drawn to this ministry a couple of years ago as my wife Tina and I were looking for ways to help folks who are dealing with difficult times. This really became a calling for us as we participated in what was then Discovery's Advent Conspiracy. As we're trying to figure out how to take our outreach to another level, and where to even start, we learned about the Benevolence Team. It's been a great fit for us. It helped me to understand what many of our community face on a daily basis and discern how we can help. I really feel good about how Discovery and the Benevolence Team has impacted those we support and hear positive anecdotes about Discovery based upon the work of the team. If you'd like to get involved or learn about the ministry, check out the Advent Guide on the website or in our weekly email. Visit the Advent display in the lobby to find out ways you can give to help our vulnerable neighbors this Advent. Merry Christmas. Good morning, Discovery. Hey, we're cheating as a church. Advent isn't until December 2nd, but we're getting a head start. I hope that's okay with you. Um, I think we need Advent earlier than normal this year. I think we're in great need of it. So I would like to read for us a very well-known Advent passage. And if you're able, I'm actually going to invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word. This is a, a Hebrew Scriptures passage that for many of us we're well familiar with. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And on those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us, a child is born. And to us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, we're, come on now. I know we're not Lutheran, but we can fake it. What normally happens in this situation is the pastor will say, this is the word of the Lord, and then the Catholics and the Lutherans and the high church people say, thanks be to God. Uh, we, we can do a mulligan on this, I feel. All right. 
Uh, I'll do the last line, and then I'll say this is the word of the Lord, and then you can all say together in one voice, thanks be to God. Uh, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. This is the word of the Lord. All right, you can take a seat. Freaking evangelicals, right? Like, what do you do with us? Hey, listen, if you're new to church, like if you, if you, if you don't have much background in church, like many of us, uh, we came from that. Like I did not have much background in church until I was a teenager. So just a little hot tip. If you're new to church, it's helpful to know that this passage of Scripture I just read for us, it brings like tremendous comfort to Christians. It's, it's, just, it's just one of those go-to passages that's very precious to those of us who have been in church a long time. Uh, I don't know, those of you who are more long-termers, I don't know how you feel about Isaiah chapter 9, but it, it, it does stir something really deep inside. I think part of that comfort is the familiarity of it. I think there's some of that. We read it every year at Advent or Christmas time, and so I think what happens is every year we approach Christmas with an ache, like we definitely approach it with an excitement and an anticipation, but we also absolutely approach Advent and Christmas with a grief and a pain and an ache. And so we hear this hopeful passage that it's like a, it, it sobs or it bombs the ache of our soul year after year after year. And so I think what happens is as you, as you get a few reps under your belt in church, you start stacking this prophecy year after year after year, all of the times that you've come to church and heard the Isaiah prophecy and thought about the pain in this world and all that's going on in the world, in our own worlds. And so for some of you, you know, you've heard this five or ten times now, but for some of you, like today is like your 35th reading of it or your 50th reading of it or not to be too pointed, but particularly on this side of the room, for some of you, like your 60th reading <laughs> of this passage. I know you felt that a little bit. That there will come a day when Jesus sets up his reign on this earth. And I don't mean this lightly, but this passage is a little bit like your favorite song from your teenage years. I don't mean to make it flippant, but it's like you hear that song now, and it brings up more than just the lyrics. It brings up like, well, it's not nostalgia, it's more than nostalgia. It brings up memory and ache and hope and yearning. A couple of years ago, I was watching the Beatles documentary, Get Back. I don't know if you've seen that. It's like six hours. It's Peter Jackson, the guy that did Lord of the Rings. He's incapable of making a short film. So it's, it's six or seven, or is it nine hours? It's hours and hours of watching the Beatles create an album. And for those of us who grew up on the Beatles, I'm one of those guys, just the moment that Paul McCartney sits down and for the first time tries the long and winding road. What happens in that moment is his first time saying it connects with my 500th time hearing it. And I suddenly like connect my whole life back to that moment. Does that make sense to you? That's kind of what happens with the songs of our childhood and our teenagehood. I think that's what's going on with this passage as well. I suppose the word for it is anticipation, possibility. Um, a promise and a hope of peace one day. And so you hear this passage and you start to look ahead to that day. And I don't know about you, but I'm ready for that day. Like, let's go on that day where the government will be on Jesus' shoulders, where we will be reigned, uh, ruled by a reigning Prince of Peace, a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, the everlasting Father. You just look around today and you just see so much human conflict in the world. Like, it's absolutely overwhelming. Israel and Palestine, Ukraine and Russia, conflict, conflict, conflict. I don't know if you're like this, but I cannot keep straight my global conflicts. I forget about some of them because others show up and get my attention. And if you're like me, I'm like, what do I do about this? Uh, I find my faith is prone to deism. I'm not proud of this, by the way, but I've paid attention to the way my faith, the kind of the momentum of my faith. And if I'm not careful, I'm prone to believe in an all-powerful God that is uninvolved because I spend too much time looking at my circumstances and not looking at the promises of Scripture. And I also see what feels initially like a disparity between the hope of God's involvement and what's going on in this world. And so one of the things I've been doing lately is praying for nations 
because my deepest belief doesn't believe it makes a difference. So I'm praying for nations in protest against my deism. I don't know if that sounds weird to you, but the scriptures tell us to pray for the nations. And my default is to say, well, what difference does that make? And so I do to, to stave the doubt away. But you see these global conflicts, there's conflict everywhere. Next year, 2024, I've got some great news for you guys. We have a presidential election coming up. Do you think by any chance that this one will be smooth? <laughs> uh, we'll all just get along and see eye to eye. And what we'll do most of all in 2024 is we'll listen well to each other and each other's point of view. No, all I have to do is say four words and the whole room gets a little anxious. Donald Trump, Joe Biden. Conflict, conflict, conflict. Then you get on Facebook and Twitter, conflict, conflict, conflict. Instagram and TikTok, Okay, well, actually, that's just cute videos about dogs. But uh, for some of you, though, you're not so much consumed by conflict in the world events as you are in your own relationships. And then for some, it's not even your relationships with other people. It's like the largest source of conflict for you is your relationship with yourself. You just struggle to be at peace in your own skin. But Isaiah says that the Prince of Peace, the Wonderful Counselor, will come and will usher light into the darkest of places. It's hard to believe, isn't it? I, I find it hard to believe. I have to will it to be true some days. I have to take it on faith because of the um, circumstantial evidence. Teresa of Avila, she's a Middle Ages Catholic lady in, in many circles, including in my circle. She's an absolute legend. Uh, she's a mystic. She's one of those people that it feels like she could touch the face of God. Teresa of Avila famously said, all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. She said that in really dark times, in an era of history called the Dark Ages. And there's Teresa of Avila shining a little light saying, all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. But I like Pastor Mandy Smith's commentary on that quote. All shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. Pastor Mandy Smith says, believing that statement requires the broadest possible definition of all and well. And so we come to this Advent season in a time of conflict. But wait a minute. When hasn't there been massive conflict? Can you think of an Advent season where you have come to church in your lifetime and you have heard somebody read Isaiah 9 and you've thought to yourself, we can take a year off from that this year. We don't need that hope this year. We're all, everything's good. And even past your lifetime, can you even think of a time in human history, like ever in human history? I know 150 years ago, we didn't have TV or internet or radio. News traveled slowly, and so most global conflicts we didn't know about. That's the curse of living today, isn't that we know too much, and we don't know what to do with all that we know. But even a couple of hundred years ago, when news traveled slowly, it's not true that people could come to church and hear Isaiah 9 and say, the world is well. And so somehow... When Isaiah says the people walking in darkness have seen a great light, those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Somehow this was true in Isaiah's time and it was true in Jesus' time and it is true now and it will be true in the future. And that's what we want to dig around on today is how can we live into that reality more than we live into our circumstantial evidence I recently came across a Bob Ross painting video. I don't know if you're a fan of Bob Ross painting videos, but man, they're hard to beat. Just for a, just an incredible, calming and relaxing time. For the few of you that may not be familiar with this, and I know uh, Bob Ross has made quite a resurgence, so even those of you who are kids in the room today, you probably know Bob Ross. He's the guy with the Afro hair and the very cheerful, calming voice that paints happy little trees and says there's no such thing as a mistake and all of that. You just get to watch him for an hour or so paint a painting, and it's amazing as he just talks to you and your blood pressure goes down and your heart rate eases up. It's incredible. So recently I came across a Bob Ross painting video that really struck me because it was the episode where he came back after a leave of absence because his wife had died. It was the first episode back where Bob Ross painted his first painting 
for us after his wife died. And I'd like to play you a clip, just a 40-second clip of it. But the clip, because it's an old video, it is a little hard to understand. So I'm just going to give you a couple of hints for our ears to be able to hear it. He talks a lot about light and darkness. And one of the things you'll hear Bob Ross say is light makes no sense unless there's darkness there. He says in painting, you can't paint light on light. It doesn't do anything. Light can only be painted on darkness. And he also talks about the gift of sadness and how sadness is a good thing because how it makes us look forward to the good times. Let's take a look at Bob now. If you have light on light, you have nothing. If you have dark on dark, you basically have nothing. There we are. You know, it's like in life. It's got to have a little sadness once in a while so you, you know when the good times come. I'm waiting on the good times now. Isaiah says, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. It's Bob Ross that reminds us that light on light makes no sense, but it's very rarely true either that it's dark on dark. And I think we begin to understand that we have to work to look for the Prince of Peace in our life. And when we learn to look for the Prince of Peace, the wonderful counselor, the everlasting father, it turns out we discover him everywhere. One of my great concerns today as we look for the final coming of Jesus is how much hope we're putting on utopia. Have you ever thought about like the second, we call it the second coming of Christ. I sometimes wonder if it's actually the third or the infinite coming of Christ is maybe the better name for it. Because Jesus came in Pentecost, that's, we are called the body of Christ, like that should be a clue. He's already come back. But of course, he's also coming again. Is that the third time? Is that the 17th time Jesus is coming again? Is that the millionth time that Jesus is manifesting his presence in the end of all things? But we still, don't we? We have a tendency to say, come quickly, Lord Jesus, you're going to make everything new. But actually, all through Scripture, starting in Genesis chapter 1, it's very rare that God shows up and makes all things smooth. What he tends to do is enter right into the chaos and that was no truer than when Isaiah wrote these words, which was 2,750 years ago. When Isaiah wrote these words first, the first time, there was all kinds of conflict going on. Uh, he wrote it during the reign of King Ahaz in Judah. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became the king of a nation. Can you imagine that being 20 and ruling? And so if you think about 20, you're like, well, Ahaz's prefrontal lobe was not fully formed when he became king. Yep, and he acted like it too. He was immature. He was essentially Justin Bieber when he was 17. Remember that era when Biebs went through, he was renting Lamborghinis and crashing them all the time? That's basically Ahaz. That's a little Bible trivia for you without the Lamborghinis, I suppose. So he was 20 when he became the king of Judah. He reigned for 16 years. And this was a time when Judah and Israel and Assyria and Samaria and all the surrounding nations were fighting with violence and bloodshed over that specific piece of real estate. Like 2,750 years ago, the same fight was happening then that is happening now. That's the context that Isaiah wrote into. And uh, Isaiah, was just his job was to speak truth uh, to power. And so he was basically in Ahaz's face declaring that one day there'll be a much better king than Ahaz. And he was telling Ahaz, uh, Isaiah was a very direct communicator. He would just go right up to Ahaz and say, I'm looking forward to a day when there's a prince of peace and an everlasting king and a wonderful counselor. And Ahaz is like, hey, I'm the one with the throne here, buddy. And Isaiah is basically saying, you're an evil person. Ahaz was basically an evil king. I know nowadays it's not fashionable to speak so plainly about another human being. But the authors of Scripture are very comfortable declaring that Ahaz was evil. He didn't worship the one true God. He dabbled in foreign religions. He worshipped Molech. And he participated in all the rituals required to appease the god Molech. Ahaz made his children walk through fire. He burned them alive in a weird sort of baptism ceremony to please Molech. And also Ahaz, at 20 years of age, 
was under tremendous pressure from the surrounding nations who were all on the brink of invading. He couldn't protect his borders from four different nations wanting to invade. He probably spent most of his time as a king pretty terrified of his enemies. And just like today, in that part of the world, there was terrorism and retaliation and innocent victims and bloodshed and massive complex land disputes in the region. And into that context, Isaiah brings a word about a Prince of Peace that will bring relief to people walking in darkness. Isaiah says there will be a great light. This passage rings with hope and possibility that a day is coming where there will be a child who's more than a child, this new royalty, this new kingdom, where the reign will be administered properly, where the government will be ordered and fair and just. Unlike Ahaz, this king will be a wonderful counselor. And somehow that was true. Even though Ahaz still reigned and terror still happened and Assyria still invaded Judah, that prophecy became true and then it became true again in the New Testament. Luke records it for us. He says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. And you're to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. This last week, a number of us went on a retreat for Advent, uh, Denver Seminary has an extension called the Abbey, and they host these day-guided Advent retreats that anyone can go to. They're amazing. You just carve out a business day, and you head to wherever they are, and they guide you on how to reflect in Advent. And one of the guides, Chris, in the afternoon session, he said something that really struck me. I've been thinking about it ever, ever since. He said, when Gabriel came to Mary... Gabriel was technically telling the truth. He wasn't deceiving Mary. That's not the point. But man, did he totally understate what was about to happen. And then Chris just led us through thinking about what does it look like when God's will is fulfilled and God's promise is fulfilled? And it looks like grief and pain and crucifixion and torture and conflict. Like somehow, somehow, light shines in darkness. Light doesn't make sense in light. Light only makes sense in the context of darkness, but also it's never so dark that there's only darkness. There's always light. You have to learn by faith to look for it. And I just thought about that so much since Chris said that when he said, look at the words of Gabriel to Mary. You will raise God's child. And Mary's like, okay, I'm in. Mary had no idea what she was in for. And if someone had sat down with Mary with the terms and conditions like Apple provide you next time you try to buy a song from them and they make you sign the terms and conditions. If Gabriel had come to Mary and said, here's what's going to happen, would she have signed the document? Would she have said, okay, yeah, that sounds a lot like God's will, that my son be unpopular and people threaten his life and then as an innocent, pure man who only loves and does miracles for people, he's trumped up on false charges and then he's tortured and then he's crucified. Okay, yeah, God's will, God's will light shining in darkness. Even, as it turns out, the center of God's will can be very stormy. Sometimes in our 
faith culture, we get anxious and so we come up with cliches to manage our anxiety. Have you ever heard this one? The safest place to be is in the center of God's will. Have you ever heard that? Have you read the Bible? The safest place to be is the center of God's will. You've got to be kidding me. Sometimes God's will will send you right into danger on a human level, but safety because you're held by God. Almost like when you are in God's will, you are free. You may not be safe, but you will be free. Free to even give your life if that's what God calls for. No, it turns out that the Via Dolorosa was a particularly bumpy path of God's will. It turns out that God's peace is actually very rarely making things easier, but it is always entering into chaos. And the Prince of Peace is not always just entering into chaos, but the Prince of Peace is always redeeming chaos. And sometimes making something beautiful of it. God's peace established. God's outpost and reign set up in the midst of absolute horror and violence and evil, but also grief and anxiety. And this is the context in which I'd like us to receive communion today. Rather than have a message and then receive communion separately, I would like us to receive communion right along with Mary. And I've asked Aaron if he'll come and help us uh, receive communion. Aaron, if you'd come up and, and help prepare us. And then our communion ushers, if you would come down and just start passing out communion. And this morning, I simply want to invite us to stay in this place that we would sit right next to Mary as God appears to Mary with God's will that ends up being a bumpy road of light and darkness, shadow and hope. The reminder, communion, that God leads us through the valley of the shadow of death, but that we don't have to fear evil. The reminder that God, no matter the circumstance, can refresh our soul by leading us through green pastures and quiet waters that both can be true. And so as you receive communion, the bread that represents the body of Christ broken for you, the cup that represents the blood of Christ shed for you, I'm just going to invite you to receive communion on your own time. We're not going to receive it together today. Just receive it when you're ready. And just as you take the bread, maybe you would think of something very dark that's going on in your life or in the world. And that bread represents death, the death of Jesus Christ that takes away the sin of the world. And as you take the cup, maybe you'd think of something really light that God is doing in your life or God is doing in the life of people around this world the light that only makes sense in the context of darkness. So as we receive and as we hand out our elements, Aaron's just going to sing a song of invitation over us, just a song that you can receive as you receive communion and we'll come up and continue.
last year so green Oh, you pour out your oil and juice Goodness and mercy for me Oh, you lead me to waters and last year so green Author of Genesis records the creation story of God speaking into the chaos and bringing order to it and making beauty out of it. And there are some scholars that enjoy taking Jesus' ministry and showing how that also is a creation story, where Jesus in five days did his healings and his teaching and the Sermon on the Mount. And the pinnacle of his creation was when he died on the cross on the sixth day. And then, of course, yes, he was literally dead, but metaphorically taking his seven-day Sabbath rest in the tomb, resting from his work, so that on the Sunday morning, the first day of a new creation, where this old decaying world begins to fade away and Jesus begins to crash in the new world of hope and peace and healing, in this new world, by raising from the dead, it's not just a party trick. It's, a, it's an act of protest against the sting of death. Of course, if God is the author of life, death can't contain him, of course. And so, while well, humans thought they put Jesus to death, it turns out he was just taking his Sabbath. And then life burst, burst through from the tomb. And so, could it be that the Prince of Peace and our hope is simply in God defeating death and God defeating the sting and the wages of sin, and the price of sin, and the sting of death. It's Paul that records, where, O oh death, is your sting? Where did your sting go, death? Did you lose your sting, death? There's some wasps, they sting over and over again. I don't know if you've ever been stung by a paper wasp. I have many times. I was out walking my dog uh, a couple of months ago, and I reached in in our neighborhood. They put doggy bags around the neighborhood, and I reached in, and the local paper wasps, because they're from Satan himself, had set up a nest inside. And as I reached in, this one wasp, he just bounced off my hand and my arm and my shoulder. Sting, sting, sting. There's something about a wasp that can sting over and over again, but some bees, they can only sting once, and then they die. And death is more bee than wasp. Death itself one day will die. It gets one shot, and it's limited. 
And it's Paul who reminds us that Jesus is the preeminent Prince of Peace, the wonderful Counselor, the everlasting Father, the Almighty God who rules even over death and sin. And so that means that you and I have a, a job to do. We get to proclaim life in a culture of death. We get to proclaim freedom in a culture of sin. Uh, many of you know that I travel full-time now. I'm no longer pastoring in a local church. I spend a lot of time uh, traveling around, mostly the United States, sometimes the world. And the best thing about what I get to do is the Christians I meet when I get off the plane. It's the best. Like, I don't know if this surprises you, but a few weeks ago, I flew into Fargo, North Dakota. That's not the surprising part. The surprising part was I then rented a car and I drove an hour and a half into kind of a remote part of Minnesota. And you're not going to believe what I found in the middle of nowhere in Minnesota. A bunch of pastors, like all leading congregants who are just trying to live out a, a testimony to life over death, a testimony to freedom over sin in their neighborhood. I got to be in Bloomington, Illinois this year. How exciting is that? I got to be in Bloomington, Illinois. And then I got to drive to Normal, Illinois. There's a place called Normal, Illinois. I didn't even know there was a place called Normal, Illinois. And I drove there. And when I got there, there was what I like to call just another megachurch. And I don't mean that disparagingly. I mean that wonderfully. Just another church that you and I have never heard of, have 6,000, 7,000 congregants, the largest food bank in the area registered nurses on staff who are dedicated to helping children with special needs, just another outpost of God's kingdom. Some of us in this congregation, we've gotten to go to Costa Rica and Albania and Kenya and Paraguay. One of my favorite things when we get to go to Paraguay, if you ever get invited to Paraguay, you should say yes, because you get to fly for 20 hours to Asuncion, the capital, and then you're exhausted when you get there. And then Dan and Christy, the people that we have partnered with there for 20-something years now, they'll meet you at the airport and then they'll drive you eight hours into the most remote place you've ever been in your life. Jutu, Paraguay. I couldn't possibly tell you where it is. What I know is one of the first things you do when you get to Jutu, Paraguay, is meet a group of believers who are an outpost of the Prince of Peace, a counter-testimony to a culture of death and sin an invitation to freedom. It's unbelievable. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light, and on those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Death is defeated. We will spend eternity with God. I think that's our hope. I think that's the invitation of Advent, to look back at Isaiah and look back at Jesus' birth and look back at Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection so that we can be fueled with hope to look today at what's going on right today, where Jesus gives us the power to look evil and death right in the eye and minister right into the heart of it. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And remembering that because Jesus died and because in the wonderful words of Paul, our, we too have died and our life is now folded into Christ's. Our life is now not I, ours, but it is God's. And so this world can't harm us anymore. It can toss us and turn us around. It can sure make us anxious. It can make us afraid. But it can't do any permanent damage to those who are in Christ Jesus because we've already died. And we're being resurrected in the message of Jesus. I think about that. I think about heaven. And I think about how infrequently I think about heaven. I think about heaven the most when a loved one of mine has died. I think about heaven a lot when I'm in grief. I mean, a lot. And I also think about heaven anytime I hear of a school shooting. I think, oh, come quickly, Lord Jesus, enough. Enough that our children are suffering at our evil. And then sometimes when I hear news of global conflicts, like right now, Israel and Palestine where we don't know what to do, I think about heaven. But if I were honest with you, I do not think about heaven very much at all in my life. I don't know about you. And I've tried to figure out why that is. Why is it, as a follower of Jesus who believes in eternity, do I actually not spend much of my time on earth thinking about heaven? I've got a theory I want to share with you. I don't know if this is right. 
I may be sharing something wrong right here from this pulpit. By the way, long-termers wouldn't be the first time, let's be honest. Here's what I think it is. I'll put it up on the screen for us. I think when this life feels better than the afterlife, we don't think about heaven much. I think when the next life feels better than this life, we long for heaven now. Now, I don't know. That may not be right, but that's helped me frame it in my mind. And so I'm just going to invite you to consider how is your life going right now? And if, if I may, just to be clear, if you have a great life right now and you're not longing for heaven, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But if you are really facing hardship and you see the brokenness of this world and that makes you feel broken inside and you are longing for heaven, what a gift from God too. This week, Gordon Conwell Seminary announced the tragic death of its former president, Dr. Walt Kaiser. Dr. Kaiser is a legend in theology. Many of us who went to seminary read his Old Testament scholarship. He was one of those academics who went way beyond scholarship with his students. He just loved his students and his students loved him. So when news of his death spread over social media, all of these formal students of Dr. Kaiser's started posting tributes. Well, you can go on Twitter and you can Google Walt Kaiser on Twitter and you'll see like students where they, he autographed their theology book for them and things like this and stories of how kind he was and what an incredible immense impact Dr. Walt Kaiser had on their life. The only problem was Walt wasn't actually dead. The seminary had to quickly remove their announcement when they found out that Walt was very much alive and they replaced it with this announcement. I took a screenshot of it for you. The information we receive regarding the passing of our beloved president emeritus has proven joyfully to be false. Dr. Walt Kaiser is alive and well for which we rejoice. At the same time, we also extend our sincere regrets for the wrong information that's been spread through our website and social media and on and on. Walt Kaiser had a word to say about this. I'll put it on the screen. Here was his response. Someday you will read or hear that Walt Kaiser is dead. Don't you believe a word of it? I shall be more alive then than I am now. I'm literally at home eating pie with Nancy while Gordon Conwell published my obituary. I love that. I love that. How would it be First of all, to find out how beloved you were before you die. Isn't that the bummer of funerals? Like, man, say the nice things now. So maybe that's the only thing you'll take away from this sermon, is maybe you'll call someone you love and tell them now, rather than get up and talk at their funeral. But I hope what we take away is Walt's invitation that when this mortal coil does end for us, we will be more alive than we are now. The Prince of Peace the wonderful counsel of the everlasting God. This is the God we worship. So let's have Aaron and Alex come up and let's worship this God. And as they're preparing, let's pray. And those who are able, if you would stand as we pray. Ah, oh, Jesus, thank you that you are the Prince of Peace. And boy, do we need your light in our darkness today. 2023, as it turns out, is grim, and 2024 is not looking great, and yet, and yet, Lord, the peace that passes understanding, and yet, Jesus, you emptied yourself. You came all the way down, and you became human and flesh, and you dwelt among us, and you gave us a way to be human. You set us free from sin. You set us free from the sting of death. And so as we hear about the light shining in the darkness, Lord, we remember that you're with us today. Lord, my prayer is that this week, that we would set our eyes more on you than our immediate circumstances, and we would look for you in the surprising places. I confess, as a young man from Western Australia, I didn't think you were doing much in normal Illinois. And it turns out you are large and in charge in normal Illinois, in Jutu, Paraguay, in Katali, Kenya, and even, believe it or not, Lord, in Fargo. That was a surprise. Thank you that you're alive and well here in Broomfield. Thank you that where two or three are gathered in your name, you are here. And thank you, Lord, that we get to remember that as we worship you in song. 
We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken and great are you Lord Let's sing that again you give up you give up you are love you bring light to the dark
joyful and triumphant. Oh, come, ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and be old and born the King of Angels. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore you a happy advent and we pray that you go in the power of life and freedom go in peace